How closely do you work with the German uh, Helmholtz uh, Association? Very closely. Uh, uh, President uh, Jürgen Mlunik and I have developed a, a strong friendship and he and I uh, meet a couple, once or twice a year uh, to talk about the partnership at a very uh, sort of strategic level. Um, and then, of course, the researchers and the research teams meet several times a year. So we have workshops in both countries. We have students who go back and forth. Uh, we have, uh, obviously, by communication through email and others. So it's a very, very close partnership. Why is it in specifically with your university? Uh, well, Alberta is a, uh, you know, a very energy-rich province. Uh, energy is one of the big global challenges. Um, the University of Alberta has been a leader in energy research for uh, actually over 80, 90 years. Uh, the, the first uh, discovery of uh, how to process oil sands into oil was discovered at the University of Alberta. And, and much of the research that has enabled it to be commercialized has been at the University of Alberta. So we have a lot of people doing the science. And we are independent of the oil companies and of government. So we seek the truth and we seek to advance the science and then apply the science to enhance energy production both uh, renewable energy as well as non-renewable energy. So I think they chose us because I don't think there's a university in the world that has such a critical mass of researchers, not only in energy, but also environment. Now, these researchers, from which fields do they come from? Because, I mean, there are environmental groups which are obviously opposing what is happening yes. in North Alberta. Right. And uh, then we have the politics. Right. So how, how do you try to, to, to get these things together? Well, the researchers work um, uh, in, in all fields. So they're scientists, they're engineers, they're policy makers, they're in law, they're in business. Uh, and there are researchers who both, uh, whose research um, in, on the energy extraction side uh, helps to um, remove some of the myths associated with the oil sands. I mean, the information out there is not correct. I mean, there's a lot of inaccurate information being put forward by the environmentalists. So one example is they will claim that uh, an area the size of Florida has been disturbed, uh, which is not at all true. And they say it looks like the moon. It looks like the moon, and none of that is true. Only 0.7% of the land in Alberta has been disturbed by mining operations in Alberta. And in fact, when you fly over Alberta, you can barely see it because it's so small relative to the boreal forest. As I said, the actual mineable oil sands area is 5,000 square kilometers. Alberta's land area is 500,000 square kilometers. Is it, is it maybe because it's partially on native land, or how does that? No, I think it's primarily because the environmental movement is looking for a target. And this is a very easy target. It's in one place. Uh, they can't target Saudi Arabia. They can't target Nigeria. They can't target Venezuela. Canada is a free country. Anyone can come in and, 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 and raise questions. Uh, having said that, I don't want to appear that I am not uh, responsive to the environmental critics, criticism, because some of them are of concern. One, we have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from all energy sources. Um, and so you have to think about that. You have to reduce the amount of water usage. Water is a very precious commodity. And we are using water in many of our energy operations. So some of those things are important. But having said that, let's face it, China and India and the developing countries' energy needs are going to go up by 40% over the next 30 years. And without the Alberta oil sands, we will not be able to satisfy the energy needs uh, in the medium term. And without energy, uh, nothing is possible. So food prices will go up. Uh, you know, um, the, the access to basic needs for people in the developing world will be affected if we don't develop this, this energy resource. So when you talk about public good and what's good for the world, we have to balance the need for improved standard of living against the environmental impact. And it's the balancing that's missing. Uh, that's the dialogue and the debate that University of Alberta is actually conducting. Now, you mentioned China yes. uh, and India, of course. Right. but. Um, I mean, di didn't the Western world shift its, its primary industries to China? And uh, now we are in a sort of um, 
give and take. We have to give them uh, also the necessary energies to, to run the industry, which is producing products for our world. Absolutely. I mean, the fact that we enjoy so many low-cost products is because we've been able to have those products manufactured in China where labor costs are low, and, and that's been one of the, one of the main factors. China's uh, you know, population is uh, becoming more and more middle class. They have access to, to resources, and they want a higher standard of living. So I think it would be unreasonable for us not to um, allow them to in increase their standard of living, which means energy. If you want to raise their standard of living, uh, GDP growth is directly correlated to energy consumption. Yeah. Our, uh, the opportunity is to collaborate with countries like China and help them with developing renewable energies, big in solar energy, they're doing a lot of that. They're doing a lot of work in uh, trying to uh, find cleaner combustion methods for coal. Alberta has a lot of coal plants that are very advanced and have low GHG emissions. Um, so it's about helping to uh, develop a range of energy sources uh, while you minimize the impact on the environment to satisfy the demand for energy in countries like China mm -hmm. and India. So I think it's about helping them achieve the quality of life that we've enjoyed without the environmental impact that largely we have caused by virtue of our high levels of energy consumption. Now coming back to Germany, Yes. Uh, do you have other collaborations uh, with uh, uh, other associations like Helmholtz or is, is that one of the most important and, and, and biggest ones? Uh, I would say our Helmholtz partnership is the biggest one, uh, both in terms of the scale and energy and environment, and now we're expanding it to infectious diseases and, and neuro, neurodegenerative diseases. It is the largest collaboration University of Alberta has with anyone. Uh, and also in terms of funding, we have $25 million from the Alberta government for this partnership, so it's very large. Is, is it actually also money coming oh, from, yes. from the Helmholtz Society? Yeah, so the money is spent, so Helmholtz invests its money to do the research in Germany, and we invest our money to do the research in Canada. And the partnership is that we make equal contributions to the entire program. So money doesn't cross international borders, people do. In terms of budget and results? Yeah, so there are budgets in both countries that are dedicated to this partnership. Uh, the other countries that with which we have major partnerships is China. We recently, our prime minister was in China and we signed a partnership with Tsinghua University, which is one of Canada's, uh, China's top universities. They also want to work with us in energy and environment. Chinese- They want to get the information. <laughs> they want to get, they want to have, the, China has invested in uh, Northern Alberta. There are many Chinese companies that have invested. So they want the knowledge of how to, um, how to extract energy uh, more sustainably. Uh, so we have a major partnership with a number of Chinese uh, universities um, in both energy but also agriculture. Agriculture is a big area. The other country with which we have some major partnerships is India. We are working collaboratively with, with uh, three of the IITs, Indian Institutes of Technology. They are the leading Indian universities. Uh, we have partnerships with the IIT Bombay, Delhi, and Rurki. And we are working in areas of the use of nanotechnology as applied to food security, energy, and water. And so we are developing these very large scale, but Helmholtz is our best and our biggest partner. Ma'am, thank you very much. And um, I wish you lots of uh, success here on this uh, expo. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you this morning. Thank you, you very much. You're most welcome. Thank you.